This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, giving the sermon November 17, 2013, at Church of the Advent in Dunellen, Florida. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious Lord, thank you that we can gather this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus. And thank you because of his promise that he is here. Draw the focus of our attention to him. Open our hearts and minds to his presence. And we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's great to be with you. As uh, many of you know, this is my first time at the Church of the Advent, even though when I was in the diocese before, I knew Joe Goss very well, and so there's some history. But that's because I was involved in some diocesan things like her CEO and commissions. But it's great to be in this building. I've actually not been here before, and it's wonderful to be with you this morning. There's a lot that could be said about each of the lessons. Um, there, there are some lessons, I want to confess, there are some lessons you read and you think, what would I ever have to say about that? Uh, this is not one of those days. Instead, there's plenty. And so what I wanted to think about was, is there a way to distill it down into something that is comprehensive, that includes much of what is said in all the lessons? And the answer to that is yes. And it's actually found in the canticle reading, what we read in place of the psalm this morning, the Song of Isaiah. If you could look at this in your bulletin. I'd like to talk about just the first few verses and what they mean. You see, all of these lessons, the Isaiah lesson, the Thessalonian lesson, the Gospel lesson, are all written to people who are in some kind of serious distress, actually calamity. Um, Isaiah was written to people who had, whose people had been marauded by foreign powers. Uh, the talk about a new Jerusalem has everything to do with the fact that Jerusalem had been destroyed. That they, they were living, uh, you and I would call them victims of war, because that's exactly what they were. They were a refugee people. So that's Isaiah. Thessalonians, the same. Christians are suffering persecution. They're trying to figure out how to live a life together. They're hoping that Jesus would return. And then there were some, though, this is full of Jesus is coming back. Then... I don't have to work. And he's saying, no, that's not what we're talking about here. And calling them to diligence in the midst of that difficulty. And then Jesus in the gospel, as the disciples are looking at the beautiful temple, he said, don't put your trust in a building. It's going to go one day. In fact, this city will be destroyed. And what will happen? Nation will rise up against nation. Prophets will rise up to say, I'm the one you need to be listening to because I'm the Messiah. Jesus is warning them ahead of time. It's going to happen. Don't pay attention to people like that. All of these people are people who are living on the brink of what you and I would consider disaster. And yet, in every single one of those lessons, there are two things. Number one, there's a tremendous realism about what's actually going on. In other words, we do not live in a Christian faith that denies the fact that there can be times which are outrageously painful and difficult. We are not, we do not turn a blind eye to disaster, to war, to terrible things happening to people. The scripture is very plain that that's in fact part and parcel of what it means to live in this world. The scripture never ever acts like none of that is happening. There are faith traditions that do that, that sort of call you to sort of, you know, be happy all the time and just sort of ignore what's going on around you. We are not people like that. Just the opposite. There's a wonderful frank realism about the scriptures and the fact that whether you're Christian or not, you will have times of tremendous difficulty. Remember, Jesus even promised it to his followers. He said, in the world, you will have what? Tribulation. You know, sometimes there are verses you wish weren't in there. That's one. But the fact of the matter is, is that he under Jesus understood that we would go through very difficult, painful, and hard times. 
So this is not escapism we're talking about today at all. Instead, the challenge, the call, and the encouragement is how to live faithfully in the midst of difficulty, not trying to escape from it. As a friend of mine said rather painfully to me one day, Greg, the only way out is through. I was like, yeah, I know. So how do you do that? What does that actually look like? And it seems to me that that's where this song, the Isaiah lesson, is extraordinarily helpful. Because again, this is written to a people who know difficulty. In other words, this is not Pollyanna in any way, shape, or form. And yet, the faith testimony in the midst of difficulty in this passage is extraordinarily strong. Just the first couple of lines are literally enough to ponder for a very long time. This is the kind of thing, especially if you're in difficulty, you ought to put on a refrigerator magnet and look at each day. What, is the, what does the author say? Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. So let's unpack that a little bit. First of all, surely. In other words, what are the promises? I will never leave you or forsake you. Remember, that's what Jesus says. Paul says in Romans, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And he gives us a list of disasters, nakedness, famine, terror, sword. He said, no, no, no. In all of these things, the worst that life has to offer, Paul says what? We are more than conquerors, not because we're strong people, but rather through him who what? Who loves us. You see, the, the temptation in difficulty, because all of us go through them, and sometimes they're horrible, is that we have a feeling that, oh, if difficulty comes, that means God must be absent. Maybe he doesn't care about me after all. That's the temptation. You feel painfully alone. There's a kind of fear inside of you when you get into these places of difficulties that unless you've been through them, you really don't understand. And, and, and I know people try to be kind, and, and they say, oh, I know what you're going through. But more often than not, we kind of say inside, we're not impolite, but we say thank you, but inside we go, no, I don't think you do. But thank you for your words of kindness. This passage is very clear that regardless of what we endure, what it is that we go through, none of that causes us to be absent from the presence of God. That He is with us no matter what. He is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the scripture says. And why is that the case? Because He is good and because He loves us. How do you know about God? That about God? For all I know, God can be a monster. Well, if you're a Christian, you believe that what we see in Jesus is who God is. What does Jesus say? If you have seen me, you have seen who? You have seen the Father. Or as Paul says in Colossians, Jesus is the exact likeness of the invisible God. Now, that doesn't mean God has a human body. Although some people believe that. There's nothing in the scripture that would tell you that. Instead, what it means is the very nature of what we see in Jesus is God in the flesh. That's who God is. And that's what we say in the creed, remember? Who is Jesus? He is God from God. Light from light, true God from true God. In other words, what we see in Jesus is who God is. And who is Jesus? Powerful. Deeply kind, full of compassion and care, all powerful, extraordinarily wise, brilliant, in fact, and yet willingness to stop and to care for the lowest and the least. There's none like him, because he is, of all people on the earth, he is God made manifested. And so it is because of what we see in Jesus that we can say that this is, in fact, a good God. This is a loving God. And it is this God, see, who is with us. And the reason and how the scripture indicates that in this canticle is what is, he, what is God doing? 
Surely it is God who what who saves me. Literally in the Hebrew, it is surely it is God who is saving me. In other words, it's something that is happening right now. In other words, in the midst of the very worst of what I may be enduring, two things are true. Number one, it never negates or separates me from the presence of God. The worst disaster means God is still here. Here. Present. Not absent. And he's not just sort of dormant. God is actually at work. He is saving me. Which means he has me by the hand. He is guiding me through even the worst of difficulties. That nothing, as Paul says, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whatever, what is it that you might be facing? It is the loss of a loved one, a tragedy, a, your finances falling out, a marriage that's dying. Is it death? Is it cancer? Terminal diseases? Are those things we go through? The answer is yes. Yes, they do. Do those things separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? The answer is no. They do not. Surely it is this good God who in the midst of the worst of my circumstances is doing what? He is saving me. He is carrying me forward. Do I always feel that? The answer is no. In other words, if you make the mistake that somehow when, I, when God loves me, that means I feel his presence. And so then when I don't feel his presence, that means he must not love me. You're sunk. And in fact, what you've done at that point is made God your feelings. God is bigger than what we feel. Are there times when we feel his presence? Yes, and it's glorious. It is, what does the scripture say? It is the peace that passes all understanding. But there are times, are they not, where we don't feel that at all. Right? Not your head. Sure, of course there is. Let's be real. Does that mean that somehow God is mad at me at that point? No, no it does not. That's what the forgiveness of sin is all about. He removes the burden. He takes away the guilt. So that means... That's why nothing can separate me from the love of God. So that means sometimes I'll feel that, sometimes I'll feel nothing. Sometimes I'll just be numb. People who go through deep, deep tragedy get into a place where they don't really feel anything at all. It, it's, it's, in some ways, it's self-protective. So they don't feel anything, including God. Does that mean God is absent from them? No, you see. So that God is at work, whether I feel his presence or not, I can still say, surely it is God who is saving me. And that declaration, even when I feel nothing, even when there's nothing in my circumstances, to tell me, in fact, that is true. Because I'm willing to believe that what Jesus said is true, and that he's not a liar, and that he is, in fact, God in the flesh. I'm going to stand on that. That's what it means to say, I will trust in him. It may mean I'm not trusting in my circumstances. I'm not trusting in what I'm feeling because I'm not feeling much right now. In fact, if I'm feeling anything, what do I feel? I feel hurt. I feel anger. I feel all that. Does that help me in the presence of God? No. But he's still here. And I can trust in him. He's not afraid of what it is that I feel. He never absents himself because of my circumstances. That's what the cross shows us. The cross shows us that Jesus endured the worst that humanity has to offer and still rose triumphant from the grave. So, when I face the worst that life has to offer me in that moment, I can still say, Surely it is God who is saving me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. Does that mean you're never scared? Oh, of course not. It's, it's, it is those kind of awful times when you feel entirely out of control and you don't know what to do, that you do feel fear. But what does the scripture say in the New Testament about what happens to fear? There's only one thing that takes care of it. 
And that is perfect love. The scripture says that it is perfect love that casts out fear. The opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And so that's when I can go to God and say, God, I just want to confess to you, I'm willing to trust you, but I'm still afraid. But what am I doing? Watch my body. I, I, I'm still moving forward, right? That's the point. That's the trust. That's the courage point. That's when you're willing to say, even though I may have nothing to rely on right now except this promise, and I don't feel anything at all, I'm still willing to trust the fact that you are saving me in this moment and that you are good. That's what this word says. I will trust in him. That's why this is what ought to be on your refrigerator. This is the promise of what these scriptures offer us. That in the midst of the best and the worst that life has to offer, we serve one who has revealed himself in Jesus as completely familiar with all that we endure, who's gone through the very worst that life has to offer, who has conquered sin, death, hell, the grave, the devil, all of it. It is resurrection from the dead. And therefore, no matter what I'm facing, he has conquered it. I can take him by the hand, and I can trust that he will lead me through, that he is, even through these things that I do not understand. He is saving me. And that no matter what I face, he will never let me go. That, that I belong to him. I'm his child. And that he loves me. And he loves me deeply. So no matter what you are enduring. Whether it be personal disaster. National tragedy. Or anything in between. We have the courage to be able to step into the worst of situations. And give and share. That's, that's why more often than not. All across this planet. It's Christians who are on the front lines of disaster relief, ministering to people who are suffering serious persecution, because we know, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Courage comes out of that. And then when we are in those places where it's all just feeling like it's just happening to us, we can still know that he has not in any way lessened the grip that he has on our lives. That he will never leave us or forsake us. That nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Surely it is God who is saving me. I will trust in him and not 